Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'd like to say uh, start by uh, doing something, um, you know, just to uh, acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. We are uh, we are visitors here. Uh, this is the land of the Massachusetts people, and uh, I'd like to recognize the current stewards of this land, the, the Wamp uh, Mas excuse me, Mashmi uh, Wampanoag. I'm also going to be talking about histories that deal with many other uh, indigenous peoples, including uh, many Anishinaabeg nations of uh, Ontario, Métis nations of Ontario, and of course, the Mohegan people who I work closely with, and I wanted to recognize that. I'd also like to thank Alex. I'd like to thank you all for being here, including the people that are required to be here, who are uh, in my class and should, by the way, sign up on the old uh, sign-in sheet. If you're not in my class, you can sign in too, but that would be confusing to me at some point. Um, yeah, um, but thank you all for coming and thank you to Alex for inviting me to, to, to talk and for giving me uh, an excellent introduction, perhaps building me up a little bit more than I should be uh, in terms of, uh, of environmental stuff. But um, let's just jump right into it. I don't explicitly identify with environmental studies, uh, but I suppose it is present in my work uh, in some ways. And it's certainly present in my life as someone who's worried about the world. So this talk that I'm about to go through is uh, me trying to look at some of my recent work and think a little bit about how the environments and ecology sit within my work. Now, when Alex invited me in August, I happened to be reading a novel just for fun. It was on the natural history associated with uh, the novel, excuse me, uh, Moby Dick. And it's called Ahab's Rolling Sea. And the night before Alex emailed me about this, I had read a quote about nature. And I wanted to start the talk, probably not an obvious jumping off point when you think about archaeology, but for me, this is a natural jumping off point. I wanted to start uh, with a quotation from Captain Ahab. Now, I'm going to break many, many PowerPoint rules here. There's going to be text flying all over the place, and I apologize for that. It's, it's December, people. So there's going to be some, some long text. Uh, I'll read it for you to help it. Uh, but this is a rather lengthy and unwieldy quote from Captain Ahab, uh, uh, obviously from, uh, from Melville. And I'm interested primarily in his framing of human nature relationships. Here I'm using the sea. What he talks about is the sea as a representation for all of nature. But again, bear with me here. This is really about 19th century perspectives of nature, I suppose. Though, but a moment's consideration will teach that however baby man may brag of his science and skill and however much in a flattering future that science and skill may augment, yet forever and ever to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can make. Nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of full awareness of the sea, which aboriginally, uh, awfulness, I should say, awfulness of the sea, which aboriginally belongs to it. So here we have a, a clear, uh, relationship with nature, a humbling perspective on nature. No matter how advanced your science is, no matter, no matter how far your culture puts you apart from nature, it will just demolish you when it wants. Um, so kind of an interesting quote for the 19th century, I think. I certainly find it quite humbling and interesting uh, and forward-looking in many ways. Rather than framing nature as a passive, as, uh, as masters, as the place where people go to get value. Um, it's, it's talking about nature as having power over people. So surely you might say, if I'm gonna talk about my discipline, which is historical archeology, span which we'll talk about more in a moment, a hundred years after Melville wrote that quotation, certainly people that do the archeology span of the last 500 years are gonna have even more nuanced perspectives on nature. And so I'm going to turn to a, a key thinker uh, in archaeology, uh, historical archaeology, Jim Dietz, who spent some time at Harvard, a very influential historical archaeologist. And we're going to look at his famous book, which is now a book on tape, I found. Um, and we're going to look for a quote about nature there to juxtapose with Captain Ahab. You might think he'd have a more nuanced perspective on nature, but indeed, he does not. The earlier in time one goes, the more people were directly and intimately tied to their environment so that such disciplines as paleontology and geology are essential to the proper understanding of life in the distant past. As culture became more complex, this is the sentence right here, our removal from the natural world increased. 
Since historical archaeology treats only the past few hundred years of our multi-million year history, it follows that this last brief time would find us at our greatest remove. And here we have a clear separation between nature and culture. Culture is so advanced that you don't have to worry about nature anymore. Now, lucky for me and lucky for many of my colleagues in historical archaeology, we don't accept this sort of anthropocentric dualist perspective on nature. And many historical archaeologists have a field day with this quotation in the classroom, including myself, including in this very semester when I teach my students. Um, but it's a, a jumping off point for thinking about historical archaeology. Archaeology is becoming more and more ecological. We've come a long way from this, certainly. Now, historical archaeology, for those of you who don't know it, is the study approximately the last 500 years or so. It's the study of capitalism, the study of glo globalism, study of settler colonialism, some forms of it, uh, study of the commodification of nature in many cases. And uh, historical archaeologists, of course, do things that most archaeologists do. They dig archaeological sites, and I certainly do that. Uh, but we also look at all kinds of other types of information. We're kind of interdisciplinary, I would say. We read texts. We use oral history. We use uh, oral tradition. And we put these all together to think differently about the last 500 years, about these histories that we sometimes take for granted from just text. And uh, by the way, this is a picture of Jamestown, the first permanent English colony. And if we took Jim Dietz's advice about nature and how we're separate from it, and we didn't look at the data at Jamestown, we wouldn't have a very good understanding of what actually happened there. And what actually happened there was an absolute struggle by all accounts. People starving, people place, uh, placing their settlement in a bad place with poor hydrological conditions, people eating each other. And so if we weren't open to nature shaping culture here, we wouldn't take that environmental data and we wouldn't understand the nuances of that history. So luckily, uh, Modern historical archaeology, contemporary historical archaeology, contrary to what Dietz wanted us to do uh, in 1996 when he updated his, uh, his book, we collect myriad forms uh, of, uh, of environmental data for more traditional things like uh, the archaeology of animal bones, the archaeology of seeds, to all kinds of things like studying parasites, phytoliths, um, uh, all kinds of things, yeah. Um, and so luckily uh, for us, Historical archaeology is becoming much more environmentally attuned compared to uh, what Dietz was telling us there. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, I can't wait for him to tell me more about how archaeologists study pollen. But alas, this is not the talk for that. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the broader theoretical, uh, you know, conceptual baggage that we have to deal with when we become more ecological rather than the actual data. And I'm sorry uh, about that. But, well, actually, I'm not sorry because that's just who I am as an archaeologist. Um, so indeed, today, what I want to talk about is becoming ecological. I want to think about how historical archaeology, that is my field, or archaeology in general, is becoming increasingly ecological, especially when compare contemporary practice to that infamous quote from James Dietz. What do I mean by ecological, you might ask? Well, for now, let's just gloss it as how archaeologists attend to myriad relations they have in the world and people in the past had with the world. But of course, I'm going to come back to this at the end. In order to consider these changes in this discipline, I want to present two different case studies from my recent work. And let's begin. Uh, I want to begin with a side project that I recently com completed at the Royal Ontario Museum with my former postdoctoral researcher. Dr. Amelie Allard, who's an expert in the fur trade and who now uh, is an assistant professor at Rhode Island College. She came to work with me at the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum, and to think about the fur trade in a different way. And we didn't know exactly what it would be, but we sat down and started thinking. Uh, and this is what I'm going to describe for you. And I'm going to call it river power. I'm going to start my understanding of the fur trade, not with people but with flows of water and flows of energy. So indeed, we wanted to get together and we wanted to study fur trade histories in Canada, namely in Ontario. And we wanted to do it with a museum collection where we could rethink some of these histories from a different angle. In order to explain this uh, case study further, because we're with a general audience right now, I just wanted to give you some background about fur trade scholarship. If you look at fur trade scholarship, there's two main 
uh, themes of study. The first being studying the fur trade as an emergent economy, a new economy where people come into a new landscape, extract a form of nature that is sometimes things like beaver pelts and makes them into things like wonderful beaver, hat, beaver hats that were popular in Europe. Um, so that's one theme of study that is economics. Is everything okay, lights? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I thought like they're really disappointed. They turned the lights out. Uh, the second theme that is very popular uh, in fur trade scholarship is studying the social relations involved in this new economy. Uh, and that's best illustrated perhaps by the historian Richard White's work. He wrote this book called The Middle Ground in the 1990s, which basically reframed the fur trade, not as this um, trope of colonialism in North America where there was this extreme power imbalance, but where um, Anishinaabeg nations had the power and in fact allowed the fur trade to go on and in fact use the fur trade as a tool for extending their political power by building relationships to other powerful indigenous nations. And so those are your two themes. One where humans come into a landscape, extract value and make something cultural. Uh, one where you study human to human relationships involved in that extraction process. And where do, uh, do people study the fur trade? Well, for archeologists, certainly we study the fur trade and this is gonna sound familiar to you people in my class, of course. We study at colonial centers, naturally. We go to trade structures, we go to forts, we go to trading posts. Now, unwittingly, when we do this, we miss certain things. We, um, we miss the environment, I guess we could say. Uh, we also, I will say, I'll argue later that we're missing out on certain forms of colonial failure. And we sometimes start to write colonial histories that make it seem like colonialism is inevitable. So this approach combined with many Eurocentric sort of modernist consumptions of trade, of the trade, and it, it rec recreates what I call the colonial cartography problem, where colonists come in and see landscapes as empty, homogenous space, and they put dots on that, and that's where history happens. Now, outside of those dots, we find empty space that assumes that the finder of those empty spaces has the potential to master nature, a la Dietz, to bend it to their will. And this is even more so when we do the archaeology of capitalism, again, where people go into a place and extract value with little, uh, oftentimes they squeeze that resource until it's dry with little um, pushback. And so in all of these approaches, the environment is part of a backdrop. It's a passive background element to human progress, to human history. And certainly that's present in that kind of unfair, now that I keep saying it, quote that I shared from Jim Dietz. Um, otherwise, by the way, that book is a wonderful book, wonderful teaching tool. That's the one thing that most people, um, there's some problems, but th that's the one one. Uh, uh, so, so can we look at this history from a different angle and, and what can archeology span reveal about these, these histories? Well, modern world colonialism is often caught up with the commodification of natures, but I think archeology span succeeds in being able to document where that commodification fails where nature pushes back, where nature shapes those histories, rather than those histories shaping nature. And so indeed that nature culture divide that was present in many colonist minds when they came to this land, thinking of the land as blank, as homogenous space that could be bent to their will. They brought those blueprints in their heads about what Euro-colonial society should look like and they thought I can put it anywhere I want. But indeed archeologists can tell us in different places, they go to South Africa, they can go to Jamestown, they can talk about how those landscapes push back, how they shape those histories, uh, how, they, how, um, how the Dutch in Cape Town struggled with uh, topography and, and hydrological conditions, how in Jamestown, the fact that they put it in a certain place with very poor sources of water absolutely shaped the struggles that they would have, not to mention the people around uh, uh, and their relationships to them was another thing that they struggled with. So we can go and we can add details to those abstract natures, those blank spaces on those maps. And we can say something new, perhaps. Now, you might say, I thought this was a talk, or this part of it was a talk about um, the fur trade. Well, it is, it is about the fur trade uh, because I said so. Uh, no, I'm gonna get back to the fur trade. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna commit another PowerPoint sin on this next slide and I apologize but I'll read it to you. 
It turns out that if you look in that, that blank space, that environment outside of those colonial centers, you'll find many instances where colonialism fails, where people die, where things are lost. And this is well documented. You don't even need archaeology on its own to do this work. I'm going to give you a quote, a very typical quote that you find again and again in the diary of fur traders. This one's from the year 1800. Oh boy, that's a long one. I apologize. I, I'm really sorry about this, people. Uh, yeah. So she, that being a canoe, shooting the rapids of the Winnipeg River, which is important for this case study, had not gone many yards when by some mismanagement of the foreman, the current bored her bow down upon the shore against a rock upon which the fellow taking advantage of the situation jumped whilst the current whirled the canoe around. By the way, people in my archaeology and colonialism class use short sentences. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's much better. Uh, okay, <laughs> back to the long sentences. The steersman finding himself within reach of shore jumped upon the rock with one of the midmen. The other midmen not being sufficient active remained in the canoe which was instantly carried out and lost to view amongst the high waves. At length, she appeared and stood perpendicular for a moment when she sank down again. And then I perceived the man riding upon a bale of dry goods in the midst of the waves. Uh, this is why I have Ahab, by the way. This is appropriate, right? Uh, we made every exertion to get near him and did not cease calling out to him to take courage and not let go his hold. But alas, he sank under the heavy swell. And when the bale arose, the man appeared no more. So here we have a very typical description of an absolute tragedy that was very, very common during the fur trade. And so we thought rivers seem like a powerful force. Rivers seem like a good angle from which we can study the fur trade and think through the fur trade. It's a force that traders had to harness. It's a force that traders fears. It's a force that shaped the fur trade and the nascent forms of capitalism that rode in on it or on them, I should say. So as historical archeologists could, we study the fur trade from the perspective of the rivers, from a more watery view. And here, uh, we took great influence from the wonderful work of Anna Singh. If you haven't read this book, it's an ethnography of the uh, Matsutake mushroom, which grows in heavily human disturbed landscapes. And is this a delic delicacy that is globally traded and such. And she tells us in the book, she calls this trade of this mushroom that comes from capitalist ruins, right? She calls it a, a, a site of pericapitalism. That means that it's part of capitalism, but also separate from capitalism in some ways. And pericapitalist economic forms, like this mushroom trade, can be sites for rethinking the unquestioned authority of capitalism in our lives. So we wanted to think, like Anna Thing Singh does through mushrooms, we wanted to think through rivers. Could we do that? Yes, it turned out we could because we were working at this place, the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, lucky enough for us, the Royal Ontario Museum in the 1960s and 1970s did a good deal of fur trade collecting. And they did it in a very strange way. Um, and like many museum collections, unfortunately, not much had been done with them. They just had been collected to materialize the fur trade history in a place in case you need it it would be there, but, but it was never really used that much other than general description. Even more lucky for us, they were studying it from this very peculiar angle. They were studying it from the perspective of this trade route, which involves a lot of rivers, including the French River and the Winnipeg River. Um, and they were studying it from underwater. They were sending, uh, it, it began in Minnesota, when a diver just happened to be in a lake and looked down at the bottom of a lake and found tons of fur trade related objects. And then they reached, they reached out to the Royal Ontario Museum uh, and they created a research project that looked at the fur trade from the perspective of the water. Well, maybe didn't look at it, but collected from the perspective of the water. And this is Walter Kenyon, who is the curator at the, at the Royal Ontario Museum before me. Uh, he stayed dry the entire time. Um, we couldn't do this research now uh, because of risk management offices and such. It was incredibly dangerous work. He would stand on shore, as you should, uh, and watch the divers go in uh, on these waterways in rapids and waterfalls. Um, and interestingly enough, when you look at the records of the collection, 
like going in, the experience of these divers, you see incredible parallels between what they're saying and what that fur trader said in 1800. No one died during the collection of this data, but many people were injured and some people almost died. They didn't make that connection though. They were out there just trying to collect things to materialize the fur trade in a museum. And so that was wonderful for us. We, we got access to a collection of objects that come from the bottom of rivers. All kinds of objects, ax heads, files, musket balls, glass trade beads, bowls, thimbles. I don't know what those are, I'll admit it. Uh, <laughs> I already work here, you can't get rid of me, right? Uh, well, you probably could. Uh, <laughs> so these collections for us were more than just material evidence of a new economy or the social relations that were part of it. They were evidence of the power of rivers, a non-human force. And so we wanted to talk about river power. And we looked at the archeological literature and we thought archeologists somewhere must be writing about rivers, but you find no, not really. Uh, we found the work of one archeologist named Matt Edgeworth, who's a UK archeologist, he wrote a slim volume about the archeology span of rivers and he calls rivers, and I quote, the dark matter of landscape archeology. span And so we thought we need to engage this dark matter in some way and we have this great data set where we can do it. And so what happens in the fur trade is the canoes crash and the heavy, ob heavy uh, packages of objects sink to the bottom, the rivers pull that apart the rivers then pull them into stony crevices with a lot of cold water. And there you get, this is a crevice, a stony crevice at the bottom of the French river, filled not with crayfish eggs, filled with musket balls, 100, over a hundred years of accumulation with a crayfish on top. I've never met anyone, by the way, whenever I give talks as excited as I am about this image, but I love this image. Uh, uh, um, speaking of an environmental, sort of talk, I think it's such an interesting image. Um, and what we get is an accumulation largely of 19th century objects. This is as the fur trade becomes associated with larger companies, it becomes more and more form of capitalism. And those larger companies start to uh, push on timetables. They start to take their laminated ideal timetable and try to push it down onto river time. And the rivers often say, no, that doesn't really work for me. I'm gonna cause some accidents. So people are, you know, uh, uh, shooting rapids when they can't to meet deadlines, leading to accidents, it seems. And so we get a variety of objects, thousands and thousands of objects, copper kettles, pewter bowls. This has a maker's mark that goes to London, muskrat spears, spiked tomahawks, and a variety of firearms, including several firearms. Uh, at the time of collection, they are still, uh, still locked and loaded when they fell into the water. Now, here comes my last PowerPoint sin, I promise. Um, another very text heavy slide. This just gives you some numbers for some of these objects and where they're coming from. These are all French River, this is all Winnipeg River. These are different parts of the, the different rivers. Gives you a, an idea of the variety of objects and some of the counts. So you do have thousands of objects. Now we should note when we look at this list of largely 19th century objects, some 18th century, um, Anishinaabeg peoples had been using these riverways for thousands and thousands of years before this trade happened. Um, and people used the river for long after the fur trade uh, went out. We do find a few Coca-Cola bottles and things uh, amid uh, these collections, but largely it's just an accumulation of 19th century stuff. It's, it's associated with the fur trade becoming associated with bigger companies and the push that that is associated with that, uh, that makes some of those canoemen uh, make bad choices and have accidents. But it is quite appropriate that of all those rivers, looking at all the stuff you're collecting, the only one thing that we can say that is almost certainly made by an indigenous person, but not guaranteed, of course, there's one object. So that stands as a really interesting material pattern. We have one arrowhead and we have thousands of mass produced objects associated with the fur trade. And so you can see that new economy in a slightly different way uh, uh, in, at, at canoe crash sites, if you will. Now we can do all kinds of interesting things with the data from this, uh, from this collection. You can look at terrestrial sites and realize that terrestrial sites have things like ceramics, glass, smoking pipes, personal adornment items that you never find at the bottom of rivers. You can say, well, at the, in rivers, we find a lot of things that you often don't find on terrestrial sites like strike lights, which are irons used to uh, start, fire, start fires, 
ice chisels, guns, axes, files. Uh, you can also look at the variety of objects you find accumulated in these rivers, and you can, say, you can say new things about that history. So for instance, with these axes, axe heads, uh, you, we have over, well over 100 of these in our rivers, whereas a terrestrial site averages maybe 10. Um, same thing with the files here. Uh, you can also get a, a much uh, uh, more holistic understanding of the, the trade networks that were here. So you can see very strong connections here to the Bay of Biscay between uh, Spain and France, where they were making some of these axes. You can see connections to Birmingham, where they made some of these files. These things are things you can obviously see on terrestrial sites, because, of course, not only do the rivers grab these things, they also preserve them in ways that the terrestrial sites don't, interestingly enough. So that is my fur trade example. What is the point? Well, the point for me is it shows how nature, how water, how the flow of energy quenches capitalist thirst, but also how nature leads to colonial failure, to capitalist failure. It is capitalism, at least nascent capitalism, on the back of a force that is at least partially out of its control. And the, uh, beyond that, the, the river has a gathering power. It gathers people to those rivers. Uh, and it also creates and sorts the archeological record that we, we find. So here we have rivers, pure nature, if you will, organizing humans, organizing colonialism, organizing the capitalism, organizing divers, organizing archeologists. So that's one form of ecological relation that I wanted to share with you today. But I do have a second. I wanted to turn to a second one. Um, a different example that begins not by paying attention to a non-human force like rivers, but by forging new ecological relations with people that are affected by archeological activities, but often excluded from them. Don't worry, environmental studies. Uh, I will get back to environmental kind of stuff in a moment. So that was my example of river power. Now I wanted to talk about how by building relationships with new peoples and doing archeology span collaborative collaboratively with them, we have to rethink what archeological data actually is and how we discuss it. And here I am referring to uh, what Alex um, so politely introduced to you earlier. Uh, I've been working with indigenous peoples in New England for over 20 years, but I've been working with the Mohegan tribe of Connecticut for about 12. And we practice something called collaborative indigenous archaeology. Since 2010, I've worked in close partnership with the Mohegan tribe. And we run an archaeological field school almost annually that trains new generations of students, as Alex already told me, uh, told you, uh, while studying uh, reservation history. Now, for those of you who don't know about this form of archaeology, it is a direct outgrowth the long-standing tensions between archaeology and archaeologists and indigenous peoples. If you don't know anything else about that, you should take my classes. But you can also ask me about it after this talk. Um, in, in their most interesting forms, collaboration is not the same as consultation. It's building a partnership. It's, it, it involves capacity building uh, in communities training new generations, new peoples to do that work and control that work. But also it involves um, transforming our discipline. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Here we are, by the way, uh, lifting an 18th century foundation stone. I thought it was appropriate to demonstrate how collaboration works. But I also thought this might not be the best image to show you for those people that might wanna take my archeological field school. It looks like hard work. We don't actually do that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, very easy work. You should come to the Tufts Field School when it is, when it is uh, established. It's, all, it's in the works. Now, many people think that collaboration, collaborative archeology span is a form of what they might call, if you know anything about anthropology, they might call it a form of sort of classic anthropological relativism, cultural relativism. I'm gonna argue, and I have argued, that it is not that. It is related to it, but the transformative aspects of what we do collaboratively sets it apart from a traditional anthropological relativism. If you don't know what that is, I will come back to it. By the way, um, it's the first time in my career that I was standing in the field, surrounded 
as, as the only non-Indigenous person on Mohegan land. Happened many times after that, but it was a wonderful uh, first moment. And there I am just kind of getting mad at a, at a compass. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Oh, by the way, uh, one more thing. Yeah. Now, um, no, that's right. Yeah. So as a general background, uh, you know, I talked to you about how archaeologists sometimes change their methods as they work with new peoples. So in general, sort of an environmental thing that we do very differently than other forms of archaeology at Mohegan, uh, especially of those who have ever dug in a, a New England forest, you, you might notice there's a lot of roots. Right? Yeah. At Mohegan, there are certain plants that we do not touch. There are certain plants that, that roots are not cut. And there are certain sizes of roots that we do not cut. That means we can't dig everywhere. Uh, it also makes you a much better archaeological excavator. I always tell my students, they probably don't buy it, but it's true. Uh, so even that little thing, that's a modification of how we work. We're, we're, we're uh, leaving a certain relationship intact that's very important to the people. And that works fine with the archaeology. If, so that's a methodological change. But if you're interested in what we're finding, I mean, I could talk all day about that, but I just wanted to point out one environmental thing that's really important that we find at all Mohegan archaeological sites from the 17th century to the 20th century is a very strong, enduring relationship between Mohegan people and the humble quahog shell, the hard shell clam, which uh, the, 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 most, uh, the closest source is Long Island Sound. It is a source of traditional food it is also a source of, uh, of bead making called wampum, wampum beads, which you probably have heard of. Yeah. So I wanted to talk today about archaeological data, right? I wanted to talk about um, how archaeologists find and discuss sites as traditionally practiced and how we're kind of thinking about it in new ways and just get you exposed to some of the strange challenges that come up as you start to do collaborative work. So these show two forms that are very traditional forms of how we find archaeological sites. And by the way, if you didn't know this about archaeologists, when we think of any space, we think of it as a piece of graph paper. I think that's true. I don't want to centralize, but I think that's true. Is that true, Bruce? Absolutely, graph paper. OK, good. Uh, <laughs> um, and so this is two forms of uh, survey that we do to find archaeological sites. This is me teaching my students how to do this, pedestrian survey. It's walking across the land in a systematic way. It's the hardest thing I teach in classrooms, in the field, no matter what. You have to learn how to use a, a compass, as seen by my face in that earlier photo. You have to learn how to count your paces. You have to learn how to work with another group. Uh, and our students kind of walk across each line, ideally. And they look around and they say, I see things. I don't see things. I write those things down, whatever. I see stone walls. I see artifact scatters. Now, if we can't see things, and oftentimes we can't because New England has a lot of leaves that fall down every year, they become dirt, cover over archaeological sites. We have to dig into the ground. So every one of these dots, we might dig what we call a shovel test pit. It's a 50, 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter square hole that allows us to see what's under the ground. And we might find things like artifacts. And we might not find things. And you'll get a pattern. There's things here. There's not things here, that kind of a thing. Now, for those of you out there, oh. When you dig, by the way, when you dig a shovel test pit, I don't know if anyone's ever dug one of these, but what you're doing is you dig until you don't find anything anymore. You dig through culture until you see pure nature, and that's when you stop. And that's how archaeologists kind of think of things usually. Now, what is the word for those archaeologists out there? What is the word that archaeologists typically use on a landscape where they haven't found anything? What Does anyone know? I know some people know. No pressure. What is the word that archaeologists use when there's nothing on the landscape that they are interested in? Yes, sterile. sterile. That's absolutely correct. So you don't find anything. You say that test pit was sterile. That part of the landscape is sterile. Now, that is quite harmful to Mohegan worldviews. Even to my worldview, I would say. What about the immaterial or less durable human traces that are present? on landscapes is the question. What about those? Um, and so this is a challenge that comes up when archeologists work with communities and design research with communities. No archeological data equals sterile, but what if there's important things on that landscape? What do you call it, right? Um, this came uh, to a head at this 
place where we work at Mohegan Lands. This is Cochigan Rock, a large, one of the largest glacial erratic boulders in New England. It was moved here by a glacier from Canada during the Ice Age. Has a natural rock shelter here. Oh, and you can see my students uh, from 2013 there. Um, when we went to look at this site uh, and do those things, those forms of archaeological survey I talked about, we didn't find anything. We did found very little. We found one actual um, 19th century smoking pipe in a huge swath of land. And so by traditional archaeological nomenclature, this place was sterile. It was pure nature. Yet this contrasts uh, starkly with, uh, with oral tradition, with uh, oral history, with contemporary Mohegan practice. This is a place where Mohegan people go to do ceremony. This is a place where uh, political leaders gather to discuss the newly arrived colonists um, in the 17th century. Um, so like the rivers just discussed, this rock also has a great amount of gathering power. It pulls people to it, it always has, but yet, it's also sterile from an archeological standpoint. Now, obviously the logical thing to do here is to say, well, we don't just have the archeological nomenclature, we have that other data together, we put them together. And in fact, you put them together in dialogue and you understand this place much better. It's a ceremonial place. It's a place where you don't live. It's a place where you don't leave your trash. You need archeology span there to tell you that, uh, I suppose. It certainly complements the oral history, the oral tradition. So we've changed our terminology. It took us about 10 years because we're just so ingrained saying sterile. This is the most talk of sterility I've had in a while. Uh, now we talk about the places we work in terms of what we do to them. We collected something or we didn't. No connotations of sterile culture, whatever, nature culture, that kind of a thing. Um, now, we've adopted our practices to do some new things and collect data and to protect things that archeologists typically don't care about. We've adopted this work to incorporate knowledge of uh, Mohegan medicinal plants. And this really comes from my colleague, Jay Levy, who's the uh, Mohegan field manager at the Mohegan Tribal Historic Preservation Office. He's always noticed that there, these uh, medicinal plants are scattered throughout the woods and He's always concerned that we might harm them or other people might harm them. So we've actually adapted our pedestrian survey, our survey methodology, not to just document stone walls and artifact scatters, but to document where the plants are. And here's a hand-drawn map from my field notebook that I happened to scan just before uh, this. And this is showing cultural features, but it's also these little flowers are showing, uh, it's my nice, you can see my drawing skills, obviously, uh, showing uh, plants. Uh, and medicinal skills, uh, medicinal uh, plants for, for Mohegan people. And so Jay Levy did some wonderful work here and we've incorporated it into the work we do. And this goes back uh, to Mohegan medicine woman, Emma Baker here Baker here, and Gladys, uh, Gladys Tantaquidgen uh, here, who's also an anthropologist, by the way. Um, they kept this knowledge and they tell us about why these plants are important and why we need to protect them. And they tell us about more than human entities that have always protected these uh, plants with Mohegan people. And so here's some images of some of the plants. I'm not gonna get into some of the details of this, but these are all very important plants, sometimes for food, but mostly for um, sources of medicine for Mohegan people. And as archeologists, we don't disturb these things, but we do map them. Uh, and uh, we've been spending a lot of time in the woods mapping their locations. Now to end this part of the case study, I thought it would be appropriate to end at the bottom of an excavation, the bottom of a corner of a foundation you're actually looking at. Uh, and you're looking at the bottom of the excavation. So by archeological standards, you're looking at the bottom at least at pure nature. Um, I think it's really interesting when we do this work, when we work in communities and we think about the things we take for granted, like what is nature and what is culture? What is sterile, what isn't sterile? And we start to rethink those things uh, when we have meaningful conversations and we're, we're committed to changing the ways we work and the way we think. Now, ironically, through these changes, this isn't just contemporary relevance, right? Um, a lot of these plant groves are historic groves. 
that have been important to Mohegan people for a long time. That means those plants actually are the descendants of the plants that Mohegans of the 18th century and Mohegans of the 19th century tended and cared for. They did not domesticate those plants, but they cared for them. And that's why they're still there. So as we map these uh, distributions of plants, we also understand human history. And by the way, they're always located near house sites. Okay, so that is a really kind of different example than the first, I think. Um, so that was how you rethink archeological data. Now, if you will, I'm gonna just try to conclude with, you know, wrap things up and then you might have some questions, I'm sure. Now, this is when I begin the onslaught of academic jargon. Uh, no, not really. Uh, I wanna talk about three things. I wanna talk about relations and relationships. And by the way, I've been talking about relationships throughout the entire talk. I wanna talk about this thing called anthropocentrism. And I've been talking about that throughout this entire talk. And I wanna talk about the importance of difference. Now, what does that mean? Well, we'll see. So first and foremost, in this brief talk, and I, again, I thank you for sitting there and being so attentive. Um, I've tried to show that historical archeology span offers very useful articulation points into past human environmental dynamics. And historical archeology span is changing and growing to learn about those dynamics in even better and more diverse ways. And it will become even further ecological in three steps. This will be on the final exam that we don't have. We don't have a final exam. Uh, a picture of a rhizome. So the first step is by continuing to think relationally. Now already relational thought is well established in the social sciences and humanities. But I would point out that dualistic thought, how we cleave nature from culture in many ways that we think about the world and go about our daily life, still occupies an important place in both anthropology and archeology. span A perfect example, by the way, can be seen in the work of the recent bestseller in the New York Times bestseller list, The Dawn of Everything. It was written by an archeologist and anthropologist, David Gra uh, Graber and David Wengro. It's a really interesting, and, and everyone should read it, rethinking of human history from kind of an anarchistic perspective and rethinks really uh, some of the undergirding factors of how we understand human history in terms of cultural evolution and things like this. But ultimately that work is, is highly dualistic, I would say. Now I didn't go and reread the book for this talk. I read it when it came out, but I can recall their discussion of plant domestication. And they do something like this. They say, well, a lot of people tell you that plants domesticated people. But we got news for you. It was people that domesticated plants. Of course, both of those models are completely incorrect if you're taking a relational approach. There's another way where we actually look at local places and understand plant humans as one entity doing new things that neither plants nor plant humans can do apart from one another. And that's what relational thinking is all about, I think. So we'll continue to do that, I think, as archeologists. Second, we need to become, and this is directly related to the first point about relationality, we need to become increasingly post-anthropocentric or non-anthropocentric. Now, what do I mean by anthropocentric? I mean, when we assume that humans are the most progressive species on the earth, uh, I'm sure we're open to, to thinking differently now, uh, or that we're completely separate from the worlds that we live in, that our activities have no outcome on the worlds we live in. Surprisingly, anthropologists in North America and archeologists in particular are incredibly challenged by this concept and get very angry when I talk about it, which makes me wanna talk about it all the more. What, what kind of upsets me is that I don't think anyone actually reads the literature. They say, well, we're anthropologists. How can you study humans if you don't like humans? Well, that's not what the literature says at all. You have to have, to have a glance. Um, or are you assuming that a human is the same as a stone? No, I'm assuming that I have to go and look at that relationship locally and understand it rather than have a universal understanding and laminate it on whatever I see. This is going to be a slow process. It's not just about collecting more environmental data. It's about how you think about that environmental data and understanding the relational webs of which humans are 
and of course, we're apart. Humans are not at the center of the world, nor are they fundamentally different from everything else in the world. And that's the assumption that I usually start with. Even when capitalism and colonialism show up and push in, you still have rivers. You still have sites of peri-colonialism, sites of peri-capitalism, like Singh reminds us. So we need to ask new questions about modernity and modern history that are less anthropocentric. And finally, and probably the most convoluted of the things I'm going to talk about is difference. What do we do when we encounter people with different understandings of the world, different worlds? Now, anthropologists have done this for a long time. They might go into the rainforest. They might encounter a person that sometimes turns into a jaguar. We call this the jaguar problem in my class. Um, now, classically, anthropologists approach this from a relativist standpoint. Yeah, OK. You do sometimes turn into a jaguar. But ultimately, I'm not so sure uh, that, um, that that world, that reality, is treated on equal terms as the anthropologist reality. Now, I'm not suggesting that I can actually become a shaman, because that's also equally as bad. I'm suggesting that we can work with communities to create toolkits, to create methodologies that incorporate both of those worlds together. And that's, I think, what we're doing at Mohegan, that we're trying to do. So in the classic approach to anthropological relativism, at least in my understanding, and I'm not, I'm an archaeologist. Let's be, let's be uh, fair. Um, I don't see a lot of transformative work happening where the framework actually changed. The point of inquiry actually changes together with those people you're talking to. And I think that's what collaborative archaeology does. And that's how, what a lot of people are calling the ontological turns. Ontol ontology meaning how reality is for people. I sometimes turn into a jaguar. Well, how do you do archaeology with a person that says that? Well, you create a framework that doesn't do violence to that truth doesn't mean you, you believe that you can turn into a jaguar, too. At least that's my take on the ontological turn. But if you're interested in more, you probably aren't. I've written extensively about this, this particular problem in archaeology. Um, I have another plug, actually. I'm teaching a course. Now, if you have any interest in what I've just said, I'm teaching a seminar next semester on archaeological theory called Think Like an Archaeologist with an exclamation point. So please come to that class. Please register for the class if you can. I have a flyer here if you're interested. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hopefully all that kind of made sense. But if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. But keep in mind, it is December. So let's just be nice to each other. Be ecological. OK, thank you. <laughs>
So we can't know for sure, but I think we're pretty set that that is a real pattern that we're seeing. If uh, I, I think more so than the one arrowhead to the 7,000 trade objects, I think that the 7,000 trade objects is what I'm mainly interested in talking about here today. But I think, I think that is something to think about that there's one arrowhead. You're not satisfied. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think this is a, a great place to think through um, how geologists and archeologists can think together because I think geologists obviously think in much more nuanced ways than I am, uh, but, but I'm, I'm approaching it as an archeological perspective, certainly. Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry. Happy to talk more, by the way, too. Hi, uh, Bruce Hitchner and Archeology span of the Ancient World. I think Greg's point is quite interesting because in the ancient world, we look at, for example, people focus on shipwrecks from the, uh, say the Roman period. And of course they find lots and lots of artifacts indicative of the process of exchange and trade and so forth. But the, the point here, I think, and one of the points that Greg is trying to point, points up is that it depends to a degree on the questions you ask of what, yeah, you know, and in the case of in Minnesota, for example, people become deeply fascinated by the idea of search, uh, looking for the fur trade per se. And so they're gonna find fur trade information. The real question is, is this the total picture? Does this really reflect the nature of what we have in that landscape beyond the river? But no, but in that sense, it tells you one aspect of the thing. And, and I think Greg's point about asking different questions yeah. Of the of of archaeology, uh, rethinking it is what's really important. Too often, uh, people are guided by a set of questions that are outdated or reflective of of let's say perspectives that are let's say inappropriate to actually answering the question. So I think that was a really good example of how the focus of one particular group of people on a particular set of questions limited the answers that they were likely to come up with. To some degree, it's um, not bad data. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, I think ultimately, I'm, I'm not sure that's what you know. I, I think, in a nutshell, what I was saying is, why do we start our, our histories of the fur trade with human extraction from a nature or human to human relationships when maybe we should be thinking about how the rivers started things and gathered people together? That ultimately, that's what I was getting at. I'm not sure that's exactly what you were asking, but um, but yes, absolutely. Well put. Thank you, Bruce. Well, it's one question, certainly. <laughs> it's good for a Friday afternoon. Oh, it's not Friday even, it's Thursday. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's good for a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like sitting down in a weird little nook over here. Um, I'm actually going to jump off of this conversation. Um, as an early career scholar, I'm so struck by how you're saying like, my discipline is doing this wrong, not just like I disagree with this theory, but like I'm challenging some of the the ways we think about these things. I love that. I think it's awesome. And, okay. you know, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, and, I, you know, I think what I'm saying is like, how are we asking better questions? Like, how do we do that kind of work? And how do we push our discipline forward? And whatever that may be, whatever your discipline is. And is that like hard? Like, how do you navigate some of the pushback you get from people in your discipline when you say, you know, let's rethink the way we we do this? Okay. Well, I need to be fair here. Like, I'm not the only person doing this work, and and I and I and I'm sitting on the back of of, of work of you know philosophers, for instance, that have done this work. Um, so so I don't want to make it seem like I'm the only one who thinks this. Of course, I'm not. Um, you know, if I go and talk about post anthropocentrism in the UK. Everyone's like, yeah, makes sense. I do it at an American conference and several Marxists get out and walk away, uh, which is okay with me. Um, uh, you know, if you don't have a conversation, that's okay. Um, I, I, again, I think the th thing that I struggle with most is that I don't think people, they, 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 they develop a, an idea of what something is based on a term without understanding like a, an article length treatment of it or a book length treatment of it and the context of that treatment. So many people, for instance, in North American archeology span have said, well, you can't be post anthropocentric because then you're not worried about human suffering. That, that's not true at all. That's simply not true. You can go look at the work of someone like Karen Broad, who's a philosopher and someone who studies physics. She talks about, she's a feminist. 
like she's worried about humans. She's worried about that. She's worried about how um, non-human things affect humans, right? So, and I can say that again and again until I'm blue in the face, but I need someone to sit down and read the article. So I'm just gonna keep saying it. And it's wonderful because it works out that I can keep publishing similar articles because no, you know, um, it's true that, you know, I think um, at least in historical archaeology, I think there is some, some of that, no one really thinks what, how Dietz thought like in that way. I don't want to make it seem that way, but I do think there is some of like, we don't have to do a full environmental archaeology for that reason in some way. Well, whenever you do a full environmental or a fuller environmental archaeology, you get all kinds of other interesting perspectives on the problem. So, um, so there's that. There's also the part about working with indigenous people, making room for indigenous people. The other thing I didn't point out is a lot of those that relational way of looking at the world. Indigenous people have been doing it for way longer than philosophers, right? Uh, and so um, sometimes it's not my voice that needs to be heard. It's it's me to make making the space for others to come in and and do that. And uh, I try to do that through co-authorship and try to you know make people come you know not make not make, uh, uh, make well, invite people, uh, create friendly spaces where other people want to come and talk about our discipline in places where it's not always very um, diverse. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but uh, um, what I would say is, and I, and I sometimes teach my students, I haven't done it here at Tufts, but you know, one of the things that we could do is just teach people how to peer review in a respectful manner. I mean, we're taught to just, take that other person down to build themselves up. And we're, we're given the carrot for that instead of the stick. And I think we have to make better communities that, that respect each other and, and don't get so hostile with one another. You know, I mean, I, I really think that's true. I mean, I, I remember I gave a talk once at a big university on the West Coast. I'm not going to name any names, but uh, I'll tell you if you want. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I just remember like people, I was going there and everyone said, well, you're ready for them to be mean to you, right? And I said, why, why is this part of our normal routine that this is part of the culture of academia? I'm gonna go get, share my research and then I'm expected to take abuse from someone. That's just a strange thing, right? We're all on the same page to some degree. Let's be better peer reviewers is a start though. No. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I got to peer review, but hopefully that has answered something. Uh, sorry, sorry, did you have a quick? <laughs> Or am I out of time? We actually do need to write oh, okay. out one. Okay. Thank, please join me in thanking Dr. Sapola for a great talk. Thank you.